right, so today I'm out here hiking some burn habitat in North Georgia. Gonna be out looking for, primarily for snakes. It's been raining so much that rivers and streams aren't really clear enough to try for turtles. So I'm gonna see if I have any luck with snakes today. And sometimes I do these burns and it kind of pushes the snakes a bit more upland. The rain also is gonna have that effect. So with it getting really sunny today and really warm, I'm thinking we have a pretty good chance at seeing some. So some of the things I'm gonna be doing is looking along pieces of bark, down trees, open areas of sun, and just seeing what I see. Also, I'm gonna be answering some of your Q&A questions while I'm herping. So I figure this is kind of a fun way to kind of take care of two things at once. So in past videos I've been here, I've actually been able to see timber rattlesnakes basking in some of these plants. These brush piles like this are usually a good area to look at because uh, as these things kind of break down and kind of collapse, they work like mulch and end up being very insulated. So snakes will actually spend winter kind of buried in the middle of all that. Keeps them warm. All right, so the first question comes from Cypress Knee Studio and he is asking, how do I get my teaching permits? Basically, you just apply. A lot of states will ask you to have an education plan. So you'll have to fill out a form, talks about your plan, how you plan on educating, what you're plan on educating about. Then they'll ask you uh, probably to fill out a form for what animals you're wanting to use. And then you'll also have to submit to an inspection of your facility. Um, your animals have to be cared for along certain guidelines. And then provided you fulfill all of those, they will probably issue a permit and you'll pay like a yearly fee. And that's how it works. Uh, it, I think it's great. I think that there should be more people educating. Uh, I, and it, it only helps to have more people educating and more people out there kind of spreading good information as opposed to a lot of the kind of stuff that goes around that's not good information. So I hope it goes well for you. Hope you get your permit and that you can get out there and educate, man. Awesome. Uh, that was supposed to be a thumbs up. So while I cruise, I'm gonna slow down for a minute and we'll answer one more question. Let's see, this one's from Garcia Reptiles 42. If I could pick four different species of turtles and tortoises to raise as ninja turtles, which would it be? Oh man, um, to raise as ninja turtles. That's a, hey buddy, what's up man? Pass this guy. Well, you gotta have a snapping turtle in there just as like a brute brawler type guy. Uh, I would probably do a soft shell turtle for speed, a sulcata tortoise. He could be like the tank for all of them to kind of um, run behind. He can just break through the walls. And then maybe a North American wood turtle to kind of be the brains, you know, kind of like Leonardo. So that's a fun question, actually. I like that. Um, maybe, maybe somebody making a, a new Ninja Turtles movie can take a hint from that and make uh, something interesting there. So good question, dude, I like that. All right, so right now I'm uh, texting my buddy Richard, seeing if uh, he has another spot. Maybe I can try herping otherwise. I'm um, just gonna drive around and maybe force gump my way into some other spots. The weather's actually getting warm and I'm gonna answer the next question. This one comes from underscore Henry J. Do I like Quora Asian box turtles? Would I ever keep them? Uh, yeah, I have uh, Flavo Marginata, the Chinese box turtle. Love those guys. Uh, super good personality, really interactive, and completely beautiful. That golden head is just incredible. Uh, they're definitely one of my favorites. Uh, I love those guys. Um, and then I also think some of the, like the Malaysian box turtles are really cool. They have those in Thailand, they get really big. Um, they're, you know, a lot of them are like surprisingly aquatic, which is really cool too. So a uh, big fan of all the Quora box turtles, uh, but no real plans to keep any more other than the Chinese box turtles, but who knows? Who knows what'll end up at my door. Please don't send me any.
All right, so while I'm here in such a picturesque, scenic place and I've got the car pulled over, I do wanna give a huge shout out to Sergio at Classic Subaru Atlanta. Sergio has been an amazing uh, help with getting my car. Uh, he's the best. The whole process was really easy. This is like the worst time ever to be buying a car. Uh, just everything going on in the world and supply and chips and all that stuff just made it such a different process. And I worked really, really hard to be able to get this car and to be able to use it for herping, for doing what I'm doing now. A big thanks goes to Sergio and Classic Subaru of Atlanta. So uh, let's get back in and let's do some driving. So this one is from 98 till underscore infinity. And that is when should I start feeding again after brumation? So what I like to do is I prefer to wait until your overnights are going to be 50s or above, especially if you can get your overnights consistently above like 53 to 55. Daytimes, nice and warm. And you know, you watch the weather and you kind of project this. And then if it's, if it's turtles like cooters and sliders and you know, basking species, a lot of times the first thing they're going to eat is some kind of vegetation. Mine really like to nibble on algae and new plant growth along the edge of the ponds for things like snapping turtles, mud and musk turtles. They're gonna wanna forage, so they're gonna be digging and getting into stuff. Uh, they're probably gonna be finding, especially since my stuff's outside, you know, they're gonna be finding like dragonfly larvae, little snails, uh, little aquatic insects. So I like to let those little natural items be the first things that they eat. For me to actually start offering food after uh, brumation, you know, you're looking at, usually, I usually wait, honestly, a month. Hope you like that. Snake number one. Four. Look at this, look how many questions. Friendliest turtle species, and that's from Ran the Russian tortoise. I would say friendliest. I would say it seems in general tortoises tend to be more friendly than than turtles do um, but there are a few friendly aquatic turtles and in my experience that tends to be your more herbivorous turtles um, but some people have common snapping turtles that you know recognize them and are fairly outgoing uh, so I guess it just depends Every, everything's an individual just like people all right, I'm thinking it may be a little hot to find anything under 10 now, but nothing there. Let's check the next piece. Anybody home? Nobody home. Oh, this is a good one. This one's from Disco Monkey 31 I love that name. Uh, how long does it take for a stink pot to reach sexual maturity? So musk turtles grow fairly quickly, um, and because they're not a large turtle, um, it takes them, you know, three or four years is pretty pretty standard amount of time for a male to reach sexual maturity. Female, you know, three, four, maybe five. It just depends. It's going to depend on, you know, where they live, the amount of food they eat, genetics, things like that. But, you know, within just a handful of years, uh, most musk turtles can reach sexual maturity. Uh, and they, when, once they start breeding, man, they, I don't know too many other turtles that breed like musk turtles. So they're, they're pretty cool. Answering another question. This one is from... Harry Gold Sculpture, and he asked, with your what? <laughs> this one's from Harry Gold Sculpture, and he asked, with your adult box turtles kept outside, do you offer them food or just let them forage? And I would say, in their setup, 85, 90% of the time, I would say they're mostly foraging. I mean, I do occasionally toss things in there I know they would like, uh, whether I'm digging and there's some earthworms, uh, or maybe I have, you know, some kind of random spring mix or something left over from feeding tortoises uh, but most of their time they're just in there digging around and 
Um, I think if you had a big enough enclosure, you could probably just let them forage full time and they would probably get on just fine. Uh, going into fall, I do like to kind of bulk up their diet a little bit before they go down just to make sure I know that nobody's underweight. So I will include things like crock chow. Um, I'll double down on things like earthworms, krill, uh, insects. I mean, whatever I can give them, I'll dig stuff up, give them grubs. They love grubs. That's like their favorite. And just give them as much as they can before, before winter. But you know, now in the spring, they're popping up and they're just doing their own thing and it's perfect because it's just, I don't even have to worry about them. And this year they all look really, really good. Nobody's coming up with a runny nose or anything. I'm, I'm really super psyched on that. Nada. So in a previous video, this tin had a king snake under it, though I think it's hot enough today. Oh, there we go. We finally got a snake. We got a little baby ringneck snake. Look at that. That is a very young ringneck snake. These guys actually get about twice this size. And you've got like a little nub tail too. But uh, these are a little fossorial snake. And a lot of times this time of year, these are gonna be the first snakes that you actually see. So pretty neat to see this guy. They're a very common snake, just they tend to be, just like you saw, under things and uh, tend to kind of move more at night when they move and are just a very shy snake, but harmless. Uh, one of the neat things about them is their defense is to show off that brightly colored underside. This one's in shed, so uh, the colors are a bit muted, but otherwise really pretty snake. Super stoked we were able to actually find something just because this guy's a baby and super tiny. I don't want to stress him out too much. So I'm going to go ahead and move the tin back and then let him crawl back under his tin. Garter and a ring neck. Double flip. Wow. Hey buddy. Let's see if we can get. Woo. Double flip, double flip. What's up, garter snake? I haven't actually caught a garter in maybe a couple of years. That's really pretty. It's like a golden yellow, too. Wow. All right, so I'm gonna knock out the rest of these questions while I'm sitting here taking a break from hiking around. It's actually starting to get kind of hot. Uh, so the next question comes from the underscore owl. And he says, the care for redfoot tortoise in North Carolina. So basically what I would do is I would just assume uh, same type of climate, give or take, depending on if you're in the coastal plain or the mountains. Uh, but same basic environment is where I live here in Georgia. And what you would wanna do is just outdoors late spring all through the summer early fall and then just bring them in in the winter and then periodically you're going to get decent days that are in the high 60s and 70s you can bring them back outside just remember to bring them in at night uh, you don't want to leave them overnight when it gets moist and cold uh, they can handle a little bit of cold but nothing below like you know high 50s uh, especially nothing cold and wet so that's my best advice for redfoots in north carolina basically like me all right, and the next and last question, Ag aggravatingly obnoxious asks, how does the short hair feel? Do my turtles treat me differently? This is, you know, that's actually, look at that. Man, I'm kind of losing some of my hair too. I don't know if that's a good look or not. Um, you know, I will say it's actually a really good question because turtles do recognize uh, who takes care of them. And most of mine still kind of recognize me because most of the time, even when I had long hair, I would wear like a beanie and just hair, wear it like pulled back or um, otherwise pretty much like what you see now. Um, but 
I have noticed like a couple of the tortoises, if it's just me with like a shaved head, they kind of pause for a moment, but then they realize it's me. So I think that they're responding not only to visual cues, but also chemical cues. Like they probably know my smell and, and, and things like that. So, um, and I think to a small degree, they do respond to sound. So they know the, si the sound of my voice because I do talk to them. I talk to them like they're dogs or something. So uh, yeah, uh, but for the most part, nobody's really treated me any different, um, which is nice. You know, you get a, a pretty extreme haircut. You want everybody to treat you good. And so far the turtles have been pretty good to me. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you liked this video. This is a little bit of a different one. I kind of combined two different types of videos, the herping with the uh, Q and A. Um, I just really wanted to kind of maximize both and do something a little bit different other than just sitting in my backyard. So I hope you guys enjoy this and uh, I'm gonna hike on back to the car. See you guys next time. Take care. Share these videos. Peace.